take you through a quick exercise that we did with our lower school students. Looking at an image. So this is an image in visible light. We see a man, he is holding a cup of hot coffee and a glass of cold water. We would like for you now to turn and talk to the person next to you and predict what do you think this image is going to look like in the infrared. Brandon and Noah had a, an interesting okay. hypothesis. So we think that the hot coffee is going to be red and the cold water is going to be blue and his face is going to be red but his nose is going to be blue. Ooh. So the hot <laughs> coffee will be red, the cold water will be blue, the face will be red, but the nose will be blue. blue. All right. Are you ready to find out? So you're pretty close. So the hot coffee is a little bit of a white here, um, and the cold water is blue. His nose and his face are a little bit kind of the same colors. Um, but this all has to do with this is one scientist interpretation of a gradient of how we can represent the colors. The colors, um, a lot of times we can think of them as in temperature as well. So the hot coffee is going to be clearly a different temperature than the cold water. And so that's something that we can visually see with the color gradient. We have the, uh, this cold part down here. Um, and objects that emit radiation at really low temperatures, we call them black bodies uh, because we can't visibly see their emission. We can't see any light or color coming from them. And as they heat up, just like as your stove at home, when it heats up a little bit, it starts to turn red. And then if it gets even a little bit hotter, it starts to turn orange and then maybe blue. You know that the hottest colors on your stove are what color? What does it actually get to? Anybody know? It gets white, right? That white, hot coal is actually the hottest point. Um, we're looking at the same kind of a thing. And so scientists use that idea of a, a natural temperature spectrum, which spans really the whole electromagnetic spectrum and also the whole visible spectrum. Uh, to map, as Lizzie pointed out here, gradients. And so, as Noah and Brandon predicted, if we were looking at a different temperature gradient, you can actually see there's a shift here where the nose would be, right? It's a little bit colder. We can see a little bit of a difference in color. Uh, and so if we were using a different gradient without the coffee cup and the water, I think your prediction would be right on. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple other images um, to do the same activity with. This one is an image of the Earth in visible light. Uh, we're not going to have you turn and talk to your partner again, um, but think for five, ten seconds as to what you think it might look like when we go into the infrared. And here it is. So this one you can see is a little bit of a different temperature gradient. Um, it is actually flopped. Um, so the temperature on this side here is telling you um, exactly what the temperatures are. So the blue here is the cold, and then the hot is in the red colors. The next one we're going to see is taking this into space. So this is an image of the constellation Orion. This is what we see when we look up into the nighttime sky. This is the image we see minus the lines that are just the outline of the stars. Um, but this is the constellation we see. And in the infrared, it looks quite different. Here, you can see it's um, a pretty big contrast. I'll flip between it again so you can see again. We can see some of these are really bright down in here. And this actually tells us a lot about what is going on in that area of space. It tells us about the chemicals that are there and the different star-forming regions that there might be as well. Um, you can also, with the infrared, it gets rid of all of the gas and dust that is present in the visible spectrum, so you can see a little bit further in. Next we have, this is a spiral galaxy, M101, which is commonly called the Pinwheel Galaxy. And this is a really nice depiction of seeing what we would see with the visible spectrum and then looking at the infrared, you can see pretty clearly here through the gas and dust, and again looking over here um, and seeing there's so much going on in this uh, wheel, in that spiral, that doesn't look like there's quite as much in the visible, but we can see past that in the infrared. The last image we have for you is of a nebula, and these are together so you can really see this one illustrates pretty vividly the difference in the gas and dust so that you can really see through all of that gas and dust up here. It looks like there's a lot going on, but then down in the infrared you can see right through it and see that there's actually a lot more stars that are out there that we are kind of blocked by the visible light spectrum. 
So we mentioned that there were three different targets for the SOFIA research uh, that was done. And our second primary target here um, comes from these properties of infrared. The fact that we can use the infrared spectrum to see a different picture uh, than the visible light spectrum allows us to study different objects. And one of the primary types of objects that we can study, in addition to star forming galaxies, nebula, uh, and our own planets, we can focus on black holes. And this has been a really uh, interesting development in astronomy as of late because astronomers know uh, more, more recently that our own galaxy, the Milky Way, seems to have this mass at its center that's not observable in any way. When we point our telescopes at it, we can't see anything coming from it. But the way that the stars around the center of the galaxy behave, the way that they move, the fact that our galaxy is moving in this massive spiral, when we add up all the things we know, we, we, we get this huge error in our calculation. And we check with Mr. Inaltong, uh, and it's not, it's, not, it's not our fault. There's this missing mass. That missing mass is a black hole, or at least we infer that it's a black hole. So we can point these infrared telescopes now towards the black hole in the center of our own galaxy and towards black holes in the center of other galaxies and start to reveal some of the information that's hidden behind all the interstellar dust, all of the other gas, all the other things that get in the way of our visible observations. That infrared penetrates all of those things and when we're up in the stratosphere beyond our own atmosphere, above our own gas and dust, uh, we can see those images. And so this is a really modern topic in astronomy. Uh, our, our NASA scientists are making observations on a daily basis about the nature of black holes and trying to find out more about how they might form, where they exist, and trying to confirm uh, that actually when galaxies form, they form around this mass, this invisible mass, not just invisible to uh, our own visible light, but to all of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we've talked a lot about um, the stratosphere and infrared. Now let's get to where we actually got on board the airplane. We had to learn a lot about all of this and refresh our memories before we even were aboard. These are a couple images from our um, flight week. NASA takes very seriously safety protocols. This is a NASA mission. Um, we didn't just get on an airplane and fly up. We had to go through an entire egress training um, where we learned what to do in case of loss of oxygen on the airplane, where you can see um, right here Mr. Macaron has on an oxygen oxygen bag that we actually would have to put on rather than the oxygen masks that fall from the ceiling. Um, and we had to wear these pouches with us everywhere we went on the airplane that had in our oxygen tanks and a couple of other items, our uh, life jackets in case anything happened. Once we got through our training and we're on board, um, we have down here, this is the flight operator and the flight safety operator. The flight operator is the person who really is in charge of flying the airplane. The telescope operators tell them where to move the airplane so that it stays fixed on the image, and then the mission operator will tell the pilots to move the plane one degree to the left or to the right as they need. Um, so they are also involved in checking on various um, things on the airplane as it's going on. Mr. Macaron is gonna talk on a few slides about one particular item that is on board due to the instrument that we were working with that the flight safety officer had to check on the hour every hour to make sure it was safe. Um, and SOFIA is unique in that it has its own flight safety card. So there is here, um, instead of the normal cards in the back pocket of your airplanes, we actually have a copy of it in the back of the room for you at the end if you would like to see it. I was a little worried because we had to go through this very intense egress training and you have to carry these oxygen bags and, and these emergency bags around with you, you're not actually not allowed to leave your seat on the plane unless this is strapped around your shoulder. And so we're going through this training, wondering if we should be concerned about our safety. And they said, you're flying with a 17 ton telescope that's one of the most expensive instruments in the world. You don't need to worry about your own safety. Nobody cares about you, but that telescope is not going anywhere. <laughs> so uh, that put us at ease. <laughs> So this is the cross section of the airplane. What does it look like on the inside? So we know what it looks like from the outside. Um, this up front here is the cockpit. We actually were invited to sit in the cockpit for a takeoff and landing, which was one of my favorite parts of the entire mission. Um, so we got to sit up there for one. That's 
pretty much all that happens on that second level. Down below, a lot of what happens is on the second, uh, the second third of the flight. So here we have our educator workstation, which is where we were stationed, um, and could look at the computers. And then we have the mission control operator, the telescope operator, and the scientist station. They're also on the other side is a conference table. So if the scientists, there's one science, group of scientists studying and observing um, but it's a 12-hour flight, so they're only observing for an hour or two and then they get some time off, so they might talk amongst themselves and analyze some of the data at the conference table. Next, there's this pretty big gap here, um, and there's actually a rope that you cannot cross while the flight is in motion, um, and that is to secure the telescope. Right here, we can see, we'll show you some pictures um, coming up, you can see part of the telescope and the instrument here, and then there's this wall, it's this airtight wall, and then this is the cavity of the telescope. Um, so, we're safe while we're up there, um, but that is a little bit of the interior of the airplane. So the telescope uh, that we've you've been talking about this whole time uh, is a really fascinating piece of equipment. It's a pretty important piece of equipment for NASA and for science in general. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how it works. Um, and to give you a bit of background, uh, this three mirror reflecting telescope, we're going to talk about what that means in a second, um, actually only comes out at night. It's, it's a really delicate piece of equipment. We'll talk a little bit about how it's coded and how it's made. Uh, but it's protected from the sunlight, so you'll never see a photo of the telescope itself uh, outside of ones provided by NASA because uh, this is actually a test flight that you're seeing here. And you notice it's covered. There's actually a canvas sheet over it. If you were to look at it, you would see your reflection. It's a, it's a, a huge mirror. Um, the bay door that's built in here is closed during takeoff and during landing and only opens up once we reach uh, the appropriate altitude. And so this is a Boeing 747, but it's retrofit for this airplane. So they've constructed uh, a, a basically a whole uh, cavity, as, as Lizzie pointed out, to host this telescope. But also, as the plane is flying, even though we're above most weather, uh, there's still a, a fear of turbulence. And so the telescope is actually completely isolated from the rest of a plane, not just because you have to worry about air and pressure, but also because the telescope needs to sit freely on its own and be able to stay focused on a target and not have errors in data. And so the telescope is basically fitted onto this massive gyroscope uh, that was designed to act as both uh, you know, a, a counterweight to the telescope's weight itself, but also to allow this to be completely isolated from the plane. As the plane's traveling, uh, if the telescope's fixed on a, a guide star, uh, you want, when the plane is bouncing around and hitting turbulence, you want that telescope to remain in place. And so we would see the back of the telescope, which the interior here, the counterbalance is inside the aircraft, would see it moving up and down, kind of bouncing around a little bit periodically. Uh, and, and it was interesting to realize at that moment that it wasn't the telescope that was bouncing up and down periodically, it was us. The telescope was remaining absolutely still, and the plane was moving and hitting turbulence around that fixed point, which as a, a scientist I found really fascinating. And uh, I think we have some video somewhere of just watching this thing move up and down going, oh man, that's, that's really neat. Um, so this telescope is uh, pretty important because it allows us to see uh, into parts of the universe that we've never observed before. And to understand why it does that, we're, we're going to kind of break down some of the science behind a three-mirror reflecting telescope. So three-mirror reflecting telescope has three parts and three mirrors. Uh, the first one is the primary mirror, and that's the main mirror that you see here. Um, the outside, the sort of, uh, if this looks more like a satellite dish, there's a reason for that. Uh, but sort of the base of that dish is the primary mirror. And the way that this works is it collects light uh, from all over and it focuses it back in to the secondary mirror, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the Sophia primary mirror is a really delicate piece of equipment. It has to be designed to be essentially flawless. So not only does its shape matter, but the way that the mirror itself is coded is incredibly uh, intricate. We were able to tour the mirror coding facility, which is housed in the same hangar as Sophia, and we were given uh, an opportunity to talk to one of the engineers who runs this mirror coding facility. And this was a science teacher's uh, dream. We were able to walk into the chamber where they do this and, and poke our heads into where they host this 2.5 meter uh, mirror. 
uh, which if you can see here is just this big sort of, it looks almost like a, like a kind of a bowl here um, or a, a flat dish. This is a sample of the mirror before it's been coated. Uh, and basically what they do is they take this into a huge chamber that is, is just the right fit for the telescope mirror and they blast, uh, they blast it with really small film of particles. So they get a little bit of dust into this chamber and they actually sand the face of the telescope uh, by pressurizing it with air. And then they completely evacuate the chamber, they empty it out uh, so there are no particles remaining. Uh, then that's called a rough cleaning. So they evacuate the chamber, they cool it again, and then they do a second round of this with even smaller particles. They do a fine cleaning. And again, they evacuate the chamber and they cool it out. And then this to me is the most interesting part. Uh, just below the mirror, there are little entry points for these tungsten filaments that are coated with aluminum. So tungsten, as you guys all remember from chemistry class, has a higher melting point than aluminum. And so they bring the temperature of this chamber up to just above the melting point of aluminum. So the aluminum melts, but the tungsten remains in place. And as the aluminum melts off of this tungsten, they get to about one nanometer thick layer of aluminum coating the bottom of the mirror. Because there's no pressure in the chamber, there's no air, uh, it's essentially an anti-gravity chamber. There's particles are flying around, they stick really cleanly to the face of the mirror. And when they've reached just the right thickness of aluminum, they turn it off, they let it cool, and now they have a, an exactly one nanometer thick layer of aluminum coated to the face of this sheet, which now becomes the primary mirror of a telescope. So when they uh, say that they are not gonna open up the bay doors, and they keep this telescope under wraps and it only comes out at night, they're not messing around. This is a really delicate piece of equipment. Um, they have only coated this mirror, what, two times? Uh, in, in, in history, and they have an entire facility to get dedicated to just that process. So that's the primary mirror. So information comes in, it hits this incredibly delicate, really sensitive mirror, reflects to the secondary mirror, which then focuses the light back, and of course it's a mirror, so it's going to be reflected back through a tiny pinhole in the primary mirror, and that's when it enters the bulk of the plane. And at this point, it hits the third mirror, the tertiary mirror, which is partially transparent. It lets visible light through and reflects only the infrared information. So you've now got two signals. We've got our visible signal coming in one uh, entrance and our infrared signal coming in another. The visible signal actually goes to the telescope operators. Uh, so they have a feed, a live camera feed from the telescope uh, that is theirs to play with. And so they can uh, make their own observations. They can use that information to look for guide stars. When they're looking at particular information in uh, the region of the scientist's interest, they use guide stars to lock that telescope in fixed position. They also use the background information to do uh, some telescope scanning or chopping. So essentially what they do is they focus uh, the visible light beam on the area that they want to. So they'll choose a tracking star, a guide star, and they fix the telescope in that position. But if all they were ever to do is record what they thought they wanted to be looking at, and there was some interference, some dust in the way, for instance, uh, in between the telescope and the, the object that it's observing, we wouldn't have a clean signal to compare it to. So what they do is they take that primary visible light and they move it over a little bit. They shift it just slightly and they bounce back and forth. And so while the telescope is doing its observation, it's always moving back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, so that we've got two signals, a sort of a background noise and then our primary target. And this allows scientists to work out any errors in their data. If they see a blip in their signal, they can check that background noise to see if that blip was something they observed or to see if it was some error in the data, something that across the beam of the telescope, some other information that they need to be concerned with. So the telescope operators are using the visible signal to bounce back and forth. The infrared uh, detector then is sent to one of the several instruments that can be placed aboard SOFIA. So the telescope actually has two different functions. Um, the first is sort of what you would expect when you think about a telescope. It acts kind of like a digital camera. It looks at a region of space, and it takes a picture of that region. And it looks through all the different areas and that, and it kind of collects that information just like a digital camera would. And so you print out a nice picture and you've got a two-dimensional image. The second, though, function of the 
uh, and so I'm sorry, so the digital camera style, there are a lot of different instruments that can be attached to Sophia. Uh, the forecast, which was uh, developed at Cornell, you can see there's a little Cornell insignia here on this big red instrument. This is the forecast, uh, is one of the uh, telescopes that, uh, instruments that uses that technology, that sort of digital camera technology. The other style, though, is really more like a radio antenna. The way that a radio antenna works, you're, you're honing in on one particular frequency. And so you want to use that one frequency to see if you can pick up a signal. Now, within that frequency, there's a modulation, and that's why you can hear sounds on the radio. But you're tuning in. You're tuning in your dial to one particular frequency. And so the satellite uh, works essentially the same way. Um, and the great detector, which is the detector that we flew with, is this style of telescope. So this instrument that you see here, uh, the blue part is the gyroscope uh, connected to the telescope. And all the other metal connected is actually the great instrument. It's one of these detectors. Uh, this, I believe, is the forecast, um, which can be connected and disconnected from the SOFIA plane. And uh, anyone is welcome to uh, create their own instrument to connect to SOFIA, the uh, sort of the engineering uh, details are published. And so scientists can uh, decide to, we want to we want to create an instrument, we're going to apply for time on SOFIA. There are currently seven, I believe, active instruments and two currently in development. Um, so if you have a, you know, a few billion dollars sitting around and you want to make an instrument to observe in the infrared and then compete with NASA engineers for time on SOFIA, you're welcome to do that. Um, but uh, let me know. and. Uh, in general, though, uh, they're using these different instruments. So we flew with the Great, uh, which has one really particular uh, drive. <laughs>